gas cars and there's electric cars, but there's also mild hybrids, hybrids, and PEVs. So let's clear up some of the confusion and misconceptions around some of these cars. It's 2021, which means everyone is scrambling to get their first EVs out, but a couple manufacturers have been in the EV game for quite a while. Aside from Tesla, Audi was the first mainstream established luxury brand to dive into the full EVs with their e-tron lineup. But we all know EVs come with significant hesitation. Range anxiety is a real thing, and the infrastructure isn't where it needs to be to calm the nerves of some buyers. But what if you had something that was the best of both worlds? This is the Toyota RAV4 Prime. It's the most expensive and most complicated RAV4 you can buy today. And while on the outside it doesn't really look much different than a normal RAV4, you take a look under the skin and, well, there's a lot of complicated wizardry going on. This is the PHEV, means plug-in hybrid, and in the most basic terms, that means that it's basically a hybrid with a bigger battery pack. In not so basic terms though, what it means is that you have a 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine. That's connected to an 18.1 kilowatt hour battery pack and two electric motors. So the gas engine only powers the front wheels, but like I said, that there's two electric motors on here. There is power going to the front axle because this is predominantly front wheel drive, but there's also an electronic motor on the rear axle. This is just an electronically controlled rear differential. There's no mechanical linkage from that front system to the back. So it's just the computer determining what's happening and what power is being sent to the rear. All of this means it's pretty efficient. You get 40 MPG in the city and 36 on the highway. You also get 42 miles of fully electric range with a full charge. And the fact that it's electric torque and it has all wheel drive means it grips fairly well, aside from these questionable tires, makes this the fastest accelerating Toyota behind the three liter Supra. It's faster than the two liter and can't really count the three liter Toyota Supra as, as a Toyota. So I would venture so far as to say that this is the fastest car that Toyota makes. Quickest car anyway. Zero to 60, 5.4 seconds. And it feels it, it's pretty quick and uh, Horsepower and torque figures, there's a lot of weird math going on because you have your gas engine, which is the 2.5 liter four cylinder engine that we're familiar with, but then you have the electronic motor on that front axle, and then you have the electronic motor on the rear axle and the battery pack, and it's filling in torque. So they say 302 horsepower, but they don't even really give a torque figure. And to be honest, I'm not an engineer, and I'm even worse at math. So I'm not gonna take a venture and venture a guess as to how much horsepower and torque this is actually making when you combine everything. But I'll tell you what, it is quick. I'll say this, if you have it in just the gas mode, it doesn't feel that quick. And in just electric mode, you get a little bit of that instantaneous shove, and that's very, you know, characteristic of an EV, but in hybrid mode, that's when you get maximum performance. That's when you get maximum quickness, when the internal combustion engine and the electric motors are working simultaneously together. And speaking of simultaneously working together, I have to give absolute kudos to Toyota in the way that they tuned this thing. The power delivery is pretty seamless, and that's not something I could say with something like the F-150 hybrid that I just drove. The transmission tuning was a mess. That was a 10-speed gearbox. This is a CVT, so that helps a little bit, but more than that, Toyota just zoomed out from the you know nuance and the detail, and they took a look at, okay, where are the most wasteful places that cars are you know, burning fuel unnecessarily? And that's at stoplights, and that's in parking lots. And that is when you have it in auto EV slash HV, so the car determines when you're gonna use what type of power. It'll say that, oh, we're at a stop sign. I'm gonna kill the, the, uh, the engine. Oh, we're in a parking lot. I'm gonna go full EV. It saves you that gas by thinking for you. And that's just really nice. And the last thing I'll say about the whole gas and electric combo working together is the fact that this will, when left in auto EV HV, generally, unless you demand a lot of power from it, basically kill off your entire EV range predominant or prior that takes priority that co that goes first and then you go to the the full hybrid so it'll burn off full ev and then you get into the full hybrid where it still has a little bit of ele electronic juice to fill in and act like a normal hybrid but you won't have that full ev capability 
Now let's say you live in like an apartment building or you have to park far away from anywhere that you can charge this thing. Obviously you, ha you do have a charger and it says about 12 hours to full, but I tested it from zero and I got it full charge in like nine or eight or nine hours or so. Um, so that's pretty nice. But let's say you don't have access to a charging port, then the car will actually charge itself. You hold this button right here, the HVEV charge hold, and then this thing will charge itself for the electric battery. And it does it in a pretty rapid rate. I was out shooting B-roll for about half an hour for the exterior, and I left the charge hold on, and I came back to about seven full, fully electric miles. Now, like I said, that's the last thing I wanna cover in terms of the powertrain. I'm sure you're sick of hearing it by now, but the, to be honest, the point of this car is the powertrain. If you just want a regular RAV4, you can have it. If you want a hybrid RAV4, you can have it. You buy this thing because it's kind of that sweet spot. It's that best of both worlds between a full EV and a gas car. You have the nice commuter range of 42 miles, which is actually pretty good. And then you have the gas engine as a backup. But when you zoom out and you take this thing for what it is, it looks like a normal RAV4. On the interior, it's much like a RAV4. You get all the practicality, the space. You don't have any compromises in terms of trunk space with battery packs. It's not creeping into the cabin, you know, raising up the floor with the back. It, it's very practical. It's very comfortable. And dynamically, it feels pretty good. This is one of the peppier RAV4s that I've ever been in thanks to that hybrid and electric system. Now, the only thing that I don't love about this thing, obviously, it's the tires. This thing is just a little bit too quick for these eco tires. And yes, it's intended to maximize your range and get more out of the car that way. But when you get the peppy and the sporty and you start pushing this thing, it, that's where it falls off. Also, you have these paddles on your steering wheel for shifting your CVT, which is unnecessary. But in any case, let's see how Paolo's doing in the e-tron. All right, we are in the e-tron, and the first thing I'm going to say about it is I absolutely love the way it sounds. It's just so futuristic. Um, something you don't hear in the RAV4, but I guess you you do you do hear it. This is just a lot more prominent, I would say. The electrification that it just sounds so awesome. It really does. Although Matt's Toyota RAV4 does sound like it's the best of both worlds, I think it does come at the expense of reliability. And even for a Toyota, I think that's still the case. I like my EVs straight up, and that's exactly what we have here in the e-tron. As a full EV, you'll probably want to know range, and to be honest, it's not great, especially compared to some of its other competitors like the Tesla and the Mach-E that, you know, boast range of around 300 plus. Um, so in this you get 218 and that is because it is the sports back. Um, if you just wanted the regular <coughs> SUV look that would get you about 204 miles uh, per charge. So let's talk power. So it has 355 horsepower and 414 pound feet of torque and for eight seconds you can unlock overboost which pushes the car to 400 402 horsepower and 490 pound feet of torque and honestly it feels fantastic for those eight seconds zero to 60 in about five and a half seconds which puts it just exactly kind of where the rav is actually so i'd be curious to see these two things race i think that this thing would win just because it has a more sophisticated uh, all-wheel drive system and I don't know, maybe it's a tire size or just the tires on that specific RAV, but they do not do a good job of keeping all that power in check. As I'm going around a corner, you know, this thing is heavy. I mentioned that it's, you know, 6,000 pounds, but it's all, you know, at the base of the car. So it really makes it feel composed and well put together. It almost acts as like an anchor. It's not a lot of body roll because of where that weight is. It honestly feels really good. I mentioned the all-wheel drive system, so this has two motors, one for the front axle and one for the rear, obviously putting it in the all-wheel drive category. Aside from that though, it's very Audi in here. It's comfortable, quiet, it's as refined as, as it can be. Let's together with Matt and uh, talk about these two cars. Hey Matt. It's a nice lima bean you have. Wow, nice uh, RAV4 uh, LE, uh, so that's cool. It does kind of look the same as every other RAV4, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Um, I think this one's more interesting, so let's talk about the looks of this one first. Yeah, let's do so, it. So give me a tour as to why... Okay, so first of all, I don't always understand the whole coupe SUV thing, but I think there's a reason for it here. Yeah, well, I mean, so we kind of explain, like, 
we were talking earlier and it looks like a giant sedan and it's it's intended to kind of look like that so this is a sports back which basically means it's more aerodynamic to give you more range and you know this being an electric vehicle range is of the utmost importance so with the sports back you get 14 more miles so i really don't know if it justifies the um the negatives that come with that like the the lack of headroom i yeah. actually kind of like the the suv look more than this sports back yeah i would agree i think the look of the traditional suv is more what i'm accustomed to i yeah. don't particularly love the coupe suv look but if you're gonna trade that style and it has a practical application like it does here right then i think it makes sense but 14 like, looking miles. Here, like there's actually arrow coming through here yeah you know you've got your grill mostly sealed off yeah so you were you were curious why they needed this if it's not a combustion engine and it's still yeah. to cool the electrical components inside yeah so my question then is like why do the teslas not have the opening like yeah. why does the mach -E not have the opening i don't know maybe they just designed the flow of air to cool those parts better i don't know i mean like if you open up this trunk or the frunk there's mm -hmm. a, all the electrical components and things like that are basically right here so it makes sense why they um need these Where's the, where's the trigger? To cool it. Here we go. Okay, so, yes. So we were looking at this before. It's down here. Yeah, hold on. No, I got it. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. So, we've looked at Tesla frunks. We've looked at Mach-E frunks. Okay, speak and for yourself. And all of them are deeper yes. than this. This is about enough room for your charging cables and like or a purse a, yeah like a, a handbag yeah and that's about it or a man purse. so there seems to be like a lot more going on under the hood here maybe that's why it needs more cooling yes but then the also question is, is like this has 218 miles of range so it has yep. less range it has less yes. frunk than a tesla yeah that's not the point anyway but yeah, okay so the sport back tesla. shape is practical it serves a purpose you get it more does range out of it but i think we would both say we would prefer the standard suv i would i would trade off because it's like what 204 versus 218 it's 14 more miles yeah so i would i would person yeah it's yeah. just a stylistic thing but everyone has their own opinion but besides that obviously audi traditional styling i love it i love I the agree. look I agree. it's hard not to like the look of an audi and i will say we talked about the grill but i will say i do like that they kept like their brand identity here like yeah. I, the mustang it, mach e is blah. The Teslas don't really look fantastic to me. They but didn't go with that good. full like electric theme on the exterior. And I do kind of like that True. they stick to the roots. It's kind of like a good True. blend between that, I would say. Yeah, I would agree. I'd say as far as EVs go, best looking one. Um, it would be better looking if it was the full body shape. But anyway, yes, best looking EV lima bean style. And wow. then we have the everyday RAV4. This is the LE, right? No, so yeah, so. <laughs> If you didn't see this badge right here as a plug-in hybrid, uh -huh. and you didn't see the Prime badge in the back, a really small one, you'd have almost no way of knowing that this is the Prius Prime. It's the most expensive, the most complex. The fact, like, you'd have no idea. It's so like under the radar. The wheels are specific too, but other than that, like, it's just a normal Rav4. I mean, you've got the blue Toyota logo up here, so like, mm -hmm. that's typical of Toyota hybrids. But other than that, it's just, it's kind of the same. And that's not to say it's necessarily a bad thing either. It's just, it's a Rav4. Yeah, I think, I, I like with the Prius, you can really tell when it's a Prime, because I think they have like unique tail lights and things like that. Like, they, yeah, I wish yeah. that they made this one stand out with the Prime, because at least to me, if I'm going to buy a Prime, I would at least kind of want to show that off. Like, I right. like when, and just, it doesn't have to be flashy and big, but just something small yeah. and minor. I mean, you can, you can spec this thing close to like 45-ish grand. Like, you can, like when you're pushing close <laughs> to 50 jump, grand. jump change. <laughs> yeah, what do we have here? <laughs> yeah, this, this one's like, 75 Yeah, tested. 78, I 78 think, yeah. is tested. So, yeah, but I mean, again, we're not necessarily comparing apples to apples, but we're kind no. of comparing the plug-in hybrid versus the EV. So right. I think, again, the reason that it can stay looking like a RAV4 is because it doesn't need to rely so much on aerodynamics for the range of the car. Like, you have the 42 miles of full electric range, and then if you run out of that, you have a gas engine as backup. So, like, it doesn't matter as much, and I think that's why it can stay looking like a RAV4. Yeah. So do you want to go inside sure, the RAV4? Let's do, let's do it. Let's do it. I don't know why I just put my seatbelt on. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, so the RAV4. We're in it. We're in it. Um, it's the same as all of the other RAV4s, just like the outside. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, like, 
Okay, so it's, it's the most expensive, it's the most complicated RAV4 that you can buy. And while it doesn't look like that in here, I mean, you have like nice seats and the leather and all that's fine, but it actually has a lot of features. Like it has um, the 360 augmented camera with like the swoopy view. Uh, you've got the kick to close and kick to open it's a good feature. Uh, tailgates. You've got, you know, like all sorts of stuff in here that really kind of transcend what you would think would be in a RAV4. So it is super nice. It is expensive and it doesn't look expensive on the interior, but it is super nice. Cooled seats, very good. Also a banging safety suite, Toyota Safety Sense 2.0. You've got, you know, your lane departure, you've got your adaptive cruise, you've got rear cross traffic and all that sort of thing. Speaking, of, really kitted out. speaking of banging, um, this JBL audio system that's in this is, JBL again. is good. No, I actually oh, you like thought it? it was good. Oh, yeah. okay. Compared to the <laughs> Supra, um, this is a lot better, absolutely. Yeah. What about the Tundra? That was bad as well. So but you I'm like not, this one? This one I do like. It sounds a lot better. Is it so, just... Well, okay. I really don't know. I guess I'd have to look just more into more it, but I'm just going to say, yeah, I actually okay, do like the way this sounds. Um, giant knobs, not a huge fan of this. I keep thinking that this the is the volume rest. one. Yes. Um, Fair point. It's right here. It's cl yeah. Okay. So question though, so this red trim, is it in every RAV regardless of exterior color? So the Adventure uh, RAV4 that I tested like two years ago, that had like the orange inserts. So all of the like rubberized stuff that you see here on the knobs, buttons, and switches was all orange. And I think the stitching was also orange in that. I just don't like So you have like different colors stitching. per trim. Like I get, it, it just, to me I associate like a sporty car and this isn't a sporty car. This is car. a sporty car. This is the fastest car Toyota makes. Outside of the Supra. It's faster than the two liter Supra. Is it really? It is, that's a fact. But it's these wheels can't slower, even like but hold again, on to it. that's a BMW. Yeah, that's true. So this um, is the fastest car that Toyota makes. And it's the XSE. The whole EV charging, e EV, HV, it's confusing yes. for about 10 seconds, but then it's pretty easy to yeah, figure out what all these buttons do. Yeah. yeah. Shall we do yours? Welcome, sir, to the height <laughs> of luxury. Yeah, we're not in a Toyota anymore, are we? No. Yeah, so I mean, in here, it's obviously, it's really modern, it's functional, it's crisp. A lot of LCD screens in here. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like they always, Audi always does a nice job with their interiors. Yes. I feel like they're usually always ahead of the time and the, the pack. Yeah, fair enough. I think, okay, so here's my issue. The screens look fantastic when they're on. And the black levels are fantastic. There's like a lot of contrast, a lot of punch. It looks crisp and rich and premium. The issue that I'm having is, where are all these these fingerprints? Yeah, the you know, you get yeah, fingerprints it's everywhere. Black piano. The piano black and yeah. on the screens and like, you just have to keep a microfiber in here with you. Yeah, this is a don't want to spend too much time on it, but we disagreed on this. You like this wood. I separator. love the open pour. I'm about it. Yeah, and I don't like it. I, I literally like it. feel like they were like, wait, we didn't put wood in it. What would you have? I have an here? idea. I don't know, nothing. They what do you just mean don't nothing? Have just more this, piano black? Don't have this separation here, I'm saying. Well, then you can't put wood there. Or carbon fiber or something that's like, you know what would be perfect? It's like something that's more... What about felt? No. <laughs> what? I don't know. Something, I'm trying to think of other materials. Something that's uh, eco-friendly. Because it makes oh, sense. You're, in a, you're, yes. a, you're an electric vehicle. Yes. Why not have it be recycled plastic from the ocean or something? Okay, that would be cool. I know, okay, so Audi just debuted their, not just, but they debuted their e-tron GT, mm -hmm. yes? And they made this whole thing about how that's supposed to be, you know, so sustainable and made from vegan leather and like all these recycled yeah. materials. Yeah, throw it right here. Like how much could it be to possibly manufacture a couple of recycled bottles into, into this? Yeah, now, I mean, now watch it actually be made out of recycled bottles and we just don't know. Adidas does it. Yeah, that would be funny, right? And they made it look like wood, but then why made it look like wood? Anyway, um, I really like the interior here. I mean, it's hard not yeah. to. It, it is, yeah. Like, you know, jumping in from from that, which has, like, all the bells and whistles and all the features, but doesn't look it, to then getting in here. It's just like, yeah, it's just more elevated, sophisticated, and advanced here. Like, yeah, you have a 360 camera, but mm -hmm. it's just not as new of technology as this does. So it's like, yeah, you have the same features, it's just a little bit older yeah i guess yeah models well, yeah or... and toyota's got horrendous backup cameras and like the resolution is like 360p yeah seriously but i will say <laughs> the backup camera on this is not it's probably 720 it's not quite 1080 yeah we're not at four it's not perfect but yet. other than that it's it's very audi it's very it's done really well mm -hmm. you have a little bit of creaking but that's just because it's plastic and it's you know harder right there um but yeah i mean like all the materials are really nice the stitching is really on point 
it's a nice place to be. It feels more open too. Back seat in the sports back, uh, we're both around 6'2", and our heads do hit the back of the roof. So yeah, I think like we could obviously manage with it, but on a long car ride, that would get annoying. But you have to stop and charge anyway, so <laughs> you'll get out the vehicle. Yeah, so yeah, the, the back seats are interesting because you'd think you would be strapped for headroom on top but you're not, you have plenty of room there. It's when you go to lean back, yeah. because they make these cutouts in the roof. Which so are awesome. Plenty They're of room. Deep, yeah. yeah, like I have plenty of room just like sitting normal, but if I want to like rest my head or yes. rest my neck, then I can't, like my head literally won't hit the head. Yep. So like leg room back there is good, right. and head room is good if you're just with your head up, but if you want to lean your head back on the headrest, that's when it becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. You obviously have more limited uh, trunk space as well in this sports back. You have a deep trunk though, because you take the trunk floor up and then you got that storage compartment. Yep, there is a bit of storage nice. underneath, but I feel like, I was about to say you could put a, um, a jumper in there, wow. Don't need that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no sir. The jumper. No sir. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Panel Technology. roof. Yeah, panel nice. roof is nice. Um, I think, I think, I think that's good. it. Yeah. Let's get into final thoughts. Okay. I know having a full EV can be daunting, but this is the future. By 2025, Audi aims to have one third their fleet electrified. Currently, they have 16,000 charging stations and 50,000 charging outlets. The e-tron also supports 150 kilowatt charging, which can theoretically get your car from empty to 80% in 30 minutes. That basically equates to 160 miles. Ultimately, the e-tron is a well-refined EV with all the elegance expected from Audi. The Audi is very nice from a day-to-day -day commuter car perspective, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find something better, but its biggest limit is its range. This is where the RAV4 shines. It's got over 40 miles of full EV range to get you to work and back during the week, and then it's got a gas engine to take you on road trips for the weekend. Plus, it's got all the benefits of still being a RAV4, one of the most practical vehicles on the road. So let us know if you're ready for full EV, or if your concerns are solved by something like a PHEV.